Good uh, afternoon. My name is Aaron Levo. I'm the Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs. Happy to be with you today, Thursday, September 30th, to moderate our town hall. We've got a packed, packed, packed agenda today, uh, and we want to get right to it. Uh, we will be live streaming a little later on uh, an important ceremony occurring at our German Ski Hospital and Cancer Center. Just bear with us while we go through that if we have some technical difficulties. I think hang in there so you can be a part of that part of our agenda. As always, please, if you have questions, use our Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions in there and uh, our experts will answer them as we go. And we'll also pause for a moment for live Q&A at the end of our presentations. Uh, and during that portion, you'll be able to raise your hand and ask a question live. And finally, we will close with celebrations, as is our custom, and we'll use the chat function at the end of the uh, town hall for celebrations. The chat function uh, won't be operable until we get to that point, and then we'll turn it on and we'll invite everyone to give their celebrations live or in writing. Okay, that's enough for me. Uh, I want to turn things over to Sharon Pearson, uh, who is our Chief Operating Officer and EVP of Clinical Operations to give us a little run through on what we're going to hear about today. Sharon, over to you. Great, thanks very much, Aaron, and thanks to everyone for joining our town hall today. Uh, Rob is not with us. He is attending the smudging ceremony, which is occurring at uh, the Jurevinsky uh, Hospital and Cancer Center site. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but important, we start today with our land acknowledgement. We are privileged to provide care on the lands of Indigenous peoples have called home for thousands of years. We recognize and respect the presence and stewardship of all Indigenous peoples as keepers of this land. So today is a very special day. Uh, today we are honoring and observing Orange Shirt Day. And I've seen many orange shirts at the Jurevinsky site today and saw many uh, on my way to work uh, this morning, which was wonderful to see. And we also are supporting or acknowledging another important day is Canada's first national day for truth and uh, reconciliation. The orange shirt a day recognizes the harm caused by the residential school system to generations of indigenous people and upholds our collective commitment to ensure every child matters. Over the last few months, uh, under the leadership of Michelle LaRue, the human rights and inclusion team has shared daily learnings and opportunities to strengthen our understanding and acknowledge the history and legacy of the residential schools. Uh, you can access the calendar on our hub uh, and the series of activities that are available as well. So I really do encourage you and everyone to have a look uh, at the hub. Additionally, our sites uh, all have their flags at half mass today. Uh, and at the Children's Hospital, uh, it will be lit uh, in orange lights uh, today as well. Uh, during the town hall, as Aaron said, we'll be live streaming, so we will pause at around noon, and we hope that goes well, technically, and, but we will pause for a few minutes to join uh, the smudging ceremony, which is a privilege for all of us uh, to be a participant of, uh, but in keeping with the ceremony, we are not able to record or live broadcast uh, the entire ceremonies, but we have been invited to listen in for a few moments. Uh, and as I said, leader, uh, our leaders at the site, including uh, Rob today. Uh, Tiffany is going to talk more uh, on our agenda today about the significance of the smudging ceremony uh, just before we join uh, at again around noon. Today, we'll talk about our usual agenda items. We'll talk about uh, operations. We'll talk about our vaccine reporting, uh, the project uh, Odyssey. And again, we'll leave time uh, for questions and answers and always uh, the celebrations. Before I move to the operational update, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the modeling that was released from the scientific table today from the, or this week from the province. Uh, and some of the conclusions and findings, uh, including that vaccination and public health measures are helping to keep the fourth wave manageable. And as I've heard it referred to as blunting the fourth wave, um, but it still is very tenuous. The circumstances that we're in as kids go back to school, uh, people go back to work and we're all going to start to spend more time uh, indoors as the weather gets colder. Uh, the expert panel did note that unvaccinated individuals are 60 times more likely to acquire, acquire or require intensive care uh, if they get ill. And that is the situation that we are seeing in our hospitals. Uh, the numbers are less of, of COVID that we're seeing uh, compared to wave three, but the patients we are seeing, as I highlighted uh, in the previous town halls, are sicker. 
And many of the individuals or the majority of individuals are ending up in our ICUs and on ECMO. Uh, the panel also noted the need to plan for post COVID conditions or as we've heard about the long haulers uh, in the media and some of the studies is that too will have an impact uh, on our healthcare system. And there are regional planning efforts underway to ensure we have a support system across Ontario West to deal with the uh, outfall of COVID. Uh, the demand for critical care and other health uh, care resources certainly will continue to have a downstream effect on, on all of our uh, resources across uh, all of HHS and across the whole sector. It's more than clear we have a very long road ahead of us and I think many of us were hopeful uh, 18 months ago that, that we would not be still having these conversations today, but we are. The increasing rates or the increasing uh, need for vaccinations to rise is essential. Uh, and our policy uh, has made it abundantly clear that our expectation is that everyone must be vaccinated to work here. Uh, Michelle is going to talk more about our policy in detail and about a special town hall that we'll have next uh, week to talk about the vaccine policy and process. I do want to say thanks to everyone. I hope that does not sound trite. Uh, as a leadership team, we are very thankful for the work and efforts. We know they're extremely challenging conditions. Uh, for everyone, our clinical and our support staff. So thanks to everyone uh, for everything you're doing to make uh, care as safe as possible uh, for our patients and continuing to support each other, uh, which is so critical through this uh, most critical of times. Um, I will move on and talk just a little bit more about operations. And again, I feel I repeat myself, but occupancy still remains very high across all of our sites. We do watch this across our region and HHS is, as we uh, refer to, is particularly hot because of the regional programs that we have. So we have seen our occupancy rates in excess of 105 and 110 percent, requiring us to uh, open unfunded beds to try to accommodate uh, those pressures. Uh, it is driven in part by increases we are seeing in our ED volumes. Again, I mentioned last week we have uh, more than matter 2019 ED volumes and we do see increasing acuity uh, coming through the emergency departments right now. And again, the demand uh, continues for critical care resources related to just our typical business, COVID or not, and ensuring we have capacity for patients, be they regional or community that require critical care, uh, and then with an overlay of the need for uh, patients um, that have COVID and require support. Uh, and we too continue to struggle with ongoing staffing challenges. Uh, again, a reminder, it's not isolated to just uh, the acute side of healthcare. Uh, our community partners are struggling immensely uh, with resourcing for home care and for community programs. Uh, and we do see the sequelae of impact uh, within, our, within our hospitals. It becomes increasingly difficult to, to uh, flow patients through the system. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a reminder, we did reopen the assessment center in light of the demand. So there is an assessment center, uh, another one with Mohawk and then another one at our West End. Um, just uh, for information, it's about 80% adult and 20% children accessing. So we're not surprised to see more pediatrics uh, given the emphasis on way four and the impact of COVID on uh, children. And in terms of uh, volumes of patients, it continues to rise approximately 400. It can uh, certainly go a bit higher than that, uh, continuing to watch those numbers. Uh, and there will be conversations about the need to open a third, if necessary, assessment center. The UCC is back to regular hours and um, back to regular volumes uh, in terms of visits to the UCC as well. Uh, and then lastly, with specifics, you can see the numbers in the ICU. There's 13, 10 at the general site, three at the Juravinsky, eight ward level COVID patients and eight patients on ECMO. Unfortunately, we do have one outbreak uh, on our burn unit at the Hamilton General, but we have made accommodations for those patients uh, on another unit so as not to impact the program. Uh, and with that, happy to take questions later on and I will pass it back to Erin. Hey, thank you very much, Sharon, for that update. Uh, next up on our agenda, we're pleased to have Dr. Dominic Mertz, our Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control, to give us an update, as always, on the epidemiology of this pandemic and what's happening uh, coast to coast to coast, uh, as well as in our local backyard. So, Dominic, uh, where are we at? Oh, thanks, Aaron. Uh, let's start off with the uh, bigger Canadian picture here. 
Um, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that um, we see most of the issues currently uh, in the territories and um, Alberta, Saskatchewan in particular. When we go to the next slide, you see the current situation. Um, you can see on the left-hand side that cases remain quite stable from a national perspective over the last two weeks. We still have uh, the same hotspots. Um, the one that, or the two that are most in the media, obviously, is Alberta and Saskatchewan. Uh, Ontario dipped further to 29. And as you can see, when you compare it to all those other circles with cases per 100,000 per week, there's only uh, yeah, three provinces left at this point that have lower rates than Ontario. So Ontario is doing quite well in terms of case numbers. Next slide. Um, I, I was hesitating whether I show this model from PHAC because uh, it's not really applicable to the local, not even the provincial level, because it's a mix of all the provinces and territories, obviously. And it tends to be overly pessimistic. We had that in the past as well. And then adding here on the next slide, the line of where we are actually sitting, it looks similar this time. Uh, Canada tends to be better, uh, to do better than, um, those national uh, models. Uh, so some good news here. Next slide. Now switching gears to, to our provincial view, um, you can see that we had that sort of um, first peak three, four weeks ago, cases slowly but steadily continued to go down ever since. And we are pretty much where we had been in terms of case numbers uh, a, a year ago but certainly on a different trajectory. Last time we were like uh, one month into an increase in case numbers. This time we are more on the downslide or in a phase where cases remain relatively stable. So we will see how things will move from here. Next slide. In terms of hospital admissions, we have more people in hospital than last year around the same time, more comparable to end of October 2020. But again, you can see compared to three, four weeks ago, um, the number of cases in hospital and in the ICU have decreased over the last few weeks. Next slide. Which brings us to the provincial models that you can see here. Uh, I, when I first presented that several weeks ago, I said that the key message here is that there's huge uncertainty uh, between the best case scenario, which is the green line and that brownish line, which would have been the, uh, the worst case scenario. And as you can see, you're pretty much following that best case scenario at this point with case numbers um, decreasing pretty much ever since that um, model came out. Next slide. Similar picture here for the ICU, um, doing actually better uh, based on the predictions. We would be hovering around 200 hospital, uh, ICU admissions at this point of time. We are instead at around 170 and today even below that. So again, some good news here. Um, there's uh, newly updated models from a couple of days ago. And uh, Again, when, when, we, when we look at that, you, say that, you see that big red box, which is the range of the last breathing. So what the um, expectations would have been anywhere within that box. And as I mentioned, we did better than that. And we continue to, uh, to follow the best case scenario at this point of time, but it's very hard to predict or impossible to predict whether this will continue to be our trajectory or whether it will go up and at what point of time it will go up. Next slide. ICU uh, admissions, again, doing better than predicted. As I mentioned, uh, we continue to be clearly below 200 at this point. Next slide. Which brings us to our local view. We had that peak um, a few weeks ago, as you know, then we came nicely down. Now case numbers have increased slightly again. So we are going sort into a Second phase of that wave four case numbers currently comparable to where we were sitting at in November 2020. Next slide. 
Um, in terms of online cases per 1,000 per week, which we use for our threshold for um, our policies, you can see that we continue to be below that threshold. However, as I mentioned earlier, we, are, we have no intention at this point to change the policies back because we expect that uh, that numbers will increase again beyond that, that threshold. And we don't want to change uh, too often between our uh, policies. Next slide. In terms of hospital admissions, um, we are pretty much where we had been last week. Um, certainly much better than three, four, five weeks ago, um, comparable to where we've been sitting beginning of December 2020. Certainly where we don't see a decrease yet is in the ICU, while we do see a significant decrease in terms of ward patients. And I, I think Sharon already touched on that. It's again, most of the ICU, that's, that's the bottleneck and that's sort of what we expected as well going into this fourth wave. Next slide. Now, where are we going from here? And these are the latest uh, SCARSIN, so local Hamilton models uh, that I'm allowed to share that are in the public domain. And as you can see here, again, I, I would say the, um, the fact that cases went down and then go up again, that was sort of predicted. The prediction was that we never went as much down as we ended up to. And the current prediction is that we should be peaking in late October and that from then on the case numbers would be coming down. And in the more updated uh, models, given that we went down further than what you see here, you would expect that that second wave of the fourth wave of 4B would be smaller than what you can see here as modeled a couple of weeks ago. Next slide. Um, these are the hospital admissions. We would have been predicted when you look at the, uh, the middle, the most likely scenario, so to say, to sit at about three admissions per day. We are currently at two, so certainly doing better than expected and much better than the five to six admissions per day that we have seen uh, end of August, beginning of September. And I think that's what people also feel uh, at the front line that there's certainly less COVID there than have it felt uh, months ago. Next slide. The modeling by age group, just to again, highlight the fact that on the very left-hand side, in terms of case numbers, the vast majority are expected to be among the 20 to 59-year-olds, followed by the uh, less than 20-year-olds, and then 60-plus. Uh, While in the hospital, we would expect to see mostly the 20 to 59-year-olds, followed by the 60 to 79-year-old age group, and then we would see the less than 20. In terms of death, uh, suddenly you see a much, much larger number of uh, cases in the above 80 year old, uh, similar numbers of deaths predicted in that group as in the 60 to 79 year old and less in the 20 to 59 year old, where's the bulk of, of um, cases predicted. Next slide. The effect of the vaccines, and I showed this before, and as you all know, and Sharon mentioned as well, um, fact is that what's, what makes a struggle or, will, or may make a struggle in this fourth wave is the unvaccinated individuals. While the, uh, the protection in terms of testing positive, uh, you only have a seven times higher risk to test positive if you're unvaccinated those risks change significantly once you're looking at severe outcomes of the infection. So requiring hospital admission, 21 times higher risk if you're unvaccinated and 79 times higher risk for an ICU admission. And these numbers, I mentioned that before, are not adjusted for age. So the true effect is actually much larger than what you can see here. Next slide. Where do we... Uh, sit at in terms of our um, vaccination efforts within the province here on the right hand side you see that for Ontario we have 86.1 percent of the population 12 plus uh, vaccinated with at least one dose 
and 80.7% of the 12 plus fully vaccinated at this point. On the next slide, you can see Hamilton and we are still lacking behind, but the gap is getting smaller. Um, we are still 3% behind in terms of uh, first doses. So we are sitting at 83.1%, but that's where we have been catching up. We've been 4% uh, behind that um, mean uh, for, for the province. It doesn't look as well yet for the double vaxxed uh, on the next slide. That's still where we lack behind 3.7% and hopefully we'll catch up here as well. Uh, one last slide, please. Um, the hope that uh, people have with the vaccine mandates that vac vaccine uptake will increase again. It, it looked like last week, we, we certainly saw a blip, but it doesn't look like it's sustained into this week. So it doesn't look like there's been an awful lot of people going out there and get vaccinated, but at least some effect and at least not a further decrease. And you can see here with the blue line, which is your first doses, that the number of people who come out to get their first dose remains relatively stable. So we still continue to vaccinate a similar number of people for the first time every single day for weeks now. And I think despite the fact that we would have hoped that this will increase, at least we, we can like, keep that pace going. You can see the uptick last week was mostly second doses. So people who finally either were eligible or decided now it's time for me to get the second dose. That's it from my end. Thank you very much. Back to you, Aaron. Okay, thanks very much, Dr. Mertz. Uh, we are gonna cut over to a live smudge ceremony shortly. I'm just, we're just trying to pick the right moment in our agenda, but we'll keep proceeding with our uh, with our speakers until we hear otherwise. Uh, it's a new uh, attempt in terms of our use of the Zoom technology, so bear with us as we work through that. But in the meantime, uh, I'll invite our next presenter, our Vice President of Human Resources, Michelle LaRue, uh, along with the Director of uh, Health, Safety and Wellness, Susan Pucciarelli, who are going to give us a bit of an update around the vaccine management policy, uh, our progress and next steps. So, uh, Michelle, over to you. Thanks, Aaron, and I'll be ready at any moment to cut over. So just a reminder, as we've discussed at previous town halls, that this is a mandatory requirement under Directive 6. The policy is required that everyone at HHS, physicians and staffs, report their vaccination status. So as of right now, we have 94% of HHS staff and physicians reported, and of those, 92% fully vaccinated. We are reaching out via emails, mailed letters, um, and various other avenues, including our leaders, to make sure that those who have not reported uh, are, are aware and are able to uh, go in and report under our, um, our, our system. We will be moving uh, ahead. Um, we are committed. We will be moving ahead in the next, in the, shortly, um, around our disciplinary measures. We are committed uh, to begin those disciplinary measures for people who are not um, compliant. Ultimately, this does mean that people be, will be suspended without pay in accordance with our hospital policies and our collective agreements. So more to come on that. Again, please just encouraging those who have not already reported to, uh, to go in and report. And if you haven't, and Susan will talk about this, there is education and, and self-testing that you must do. Again, uh, as Sharon mentioned, we do have a special town hall coming next week, details to follow. So stay tuned and looking forward to you all joining us. Next slide. Just a quick slide here that the Ontario Human Rights Commission has released uh, a document, a statement, and we're encouraging those who do feel that they may have an exemption to review that statement. And again, go to our website as to how you may uh, submit an exception if you think this is applicable to you. And then I think with that, I'm handing it over to my colleague, Susan. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, so again, this is just a reminder for anybody who is not fully vaccinated to participate in the education session. I can tell you it's, it's quick, it's very informative. You can search for it on the LMS system. Uh, if you just put in COVID-19 vaccine, uh, that will pop up for you and you can see the full title here, um, making an informed decision. So you can self-enroll in that uh, directly through the LMS. If you 
are not fully vaccinated and you do need to complete the education, you haven't yet done so, I would just encourage you to do so, please. And our next slide. Um, similarly, if uh, you have not been fully vaccinated, then you are required in addition to the education to do self-testing twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays. EHS has sent out all of those test kits now. If you should have received one and you haven't received one yet, um, please go ahead and pick one up at Employee Health Services, or you can also, uh, I'm sorry, you can also email COVID test kits at hhsc.ca. I'll put that in the, the Q&A um, piece. So you can email that and we will get a test kit sent out to you. We did have some that were returned due to incorrect addresses. So please check my HR to ensure that your address is up to date as well. Instructions are included with each kit. Um, if you are testing negative, uh, again, please take a picture, keep the proof of that because we are in our second round of audits and so if you are called upon to provide that proof, you will need to be in a position to do so. If you test positive, of course, or if you are having symptoms, then please call EHS and they will support you through that process. Um, so again, thanks to everyone around uh, the audits who have been responding and are compliant with the testing. We really do appreciate that. Thanks, and with that, Erin, I'm thinking back over to you. Now I'd like to invite our next speaker up. Uh, we were, had in our agenda order, uh, which was uh, Dave McKegg, uh, our um, chief, <laughs> chief, I'm, sorry, that threw me for a loop, just Dave. We all know him, we all love him. It's just Dave, doesn't matter what his title is. And he's gonna tell us a little bit about Odyssey. Uh, so over to you, Dave, thanks a lot. <laughs> well, thanks for that intro, Aaron. I actually uh, quite like it. Yeah, title really doesn't matter. Hi everyone. Um, just wanted to take a, a couple of minutes uh, to uh, update on where some things are with respect to Odyssey. And I know there's uh, a lot going on, obviously, in our organization as we try to um, continue to fight COVID. And I will say that, you know, next to ongoing operations, Project Odyssey does remain the, 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 the next highest priority in what we're doing as an organization to improve and deliver safe care. Um, it's such an incredible uh, opportunity for our organization. And yet, lots to do to accomplish that. So um, I'll just take you through a couple of updates. So this uh, infographic, hopefully you're familiar with now, and we are into phase three. And um, you know, if you were able to see all of the individual tasks, et cetera, that we need to do as an organization, we're actually at the halfway point of the project. So it's very exciting. Um, next slide, please. And uh, what does that mean? Well, 246 days from now, we go live. Um, that is the target and that is the plan. So um, I know that uh, is going to come very quickly. Um, so a couple of updates then, starting on the next slide. We have, um, first of all, a uh, series of things that you're going to start to see in the units. So we have over 9,000 devices that are going to be deployed across the organization in support of the new technology and paperless efforts that we'll have in our workflows. Um, starting with uh, you know, large workstations on wheels, uh, wows. So they'll be going out and starting as well as label printers and scanners, et cetera. They'll be operational as soon as they're um, installed. Um, some other devices may not be until we actually go live, but uh, it's a very um, long process, as you can imagine, to deploy so many devices in the organization. So we will be starting that next week. And of course, they will be carefully labeled and please do not move the devices they, they need to be where they need to be when we go live. So, but very exciting to see that much investment starting to, to hit the floors. Uh, in terms of the next few months, um, a couple of things that I would call out, uh, aside from, uh, uh, as it says on the uh, screen, we've got Omnicell uh, training for St. Peter's staff beginning this week. Um, we're uh, beginning to reach out to staff early next month about whether they have been selected as a super user. And it was tremendous to see over 400 submissions from our staff to become super users. You really can't understate the importance of training and support to go live on, on Epic. It is, uh, you know, it's, it's almost the, me the most important thing uh, in the project is to make sure that those that will be using the system are ready and able to use the system and hit the ground running on go live date. So uh, the super users are an incredibly important part of, our, of ourselves helping ourselves do that. 
Um, next will be the recruitment for credential trainers who will be the, actually delivering the classroom training sessions. Uh, again, a very, very critical role. And it's uh, so much better when, uh, when internal uh, folks from HHS, who th those we, we know ourselves the best, right? So when those folks can come and do that training and be super users, that, that just strengthens the project tremendously. Uh, we're uh, uh, at a point now where we've also reserved uh, quite a, a, a large selection of uh, rooms across all of sites to be used for EPIC training. And partly uh, some of them have to be configured and, and have equipment installed, et cetera, to support the training. Uh, so appreciate that's gonna put some pressure sometimes on being having access to meeting rooms, uh, but uh, we're uh, dedicating those rooms to Odyssey as we need to, to support all of that training. Leaders will start to learn more about a manager's fair. Uh, which is slated for the end of October. So keep your eye out for that. And looking ahead into December, you'll be asked to start to register for training sessions to learn the new system. Yes, that's gonna start to feel very real. Everybody in the organization that uses the clinical system will start to uh, get their training scheduled. So um, a lot starting to happen that's gonna feel uh, um, very real and, and starting to ramp up the activity towards that June go live date. So. Um, I think with that, I can, uh, I can stop. And uh, as always, if you have questions, you can see the hub materials. You can send questions to the Odyssey email address. And again, just so much appreciate all the work and effort that goes into continuing this very important, important endeavor for patient care. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Aaron. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dave. And uh, sorry, it was really nice to hear from our Executive Vice President of... Executive Vice President of... Oh, corporate affairs. Yes, Dave, I got it. Should I, should I just say it? No, it's fine. <laughs> and Chief <laughs> Financial you. Officer. I'm really, things are coming off the rails here, guys. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Dave. Appreciate that update. Uh, and again, for everyone earlier, we did uh, attempt to go live to a smudging ceremony at our Jerminski Hospital and Cancer Center. Uh, we were able to do that a little bit, but uh, we didn't want to be uh, too overt about it just to respect that ceremony hope everyone does get a chance uh, to check in and do some learning today about truth and reconciliation and the indigenous communities and peoples that we serve uh, with a little bit more on that topic uh, tiffany roblin who's our director of employee labor relations and human rights uh, is here to talk a little bit about what we are remarking on today on september 30th so tiffany over to you thanks aaron and as sharon so kindly introduced today is orange shirt day and the first uh, National Truth and Reconciliation Day. Today is an opportunity for each and every one of us to have meaningful conversations on all aspects of residential schools, the impacts they had on families, and the devastating legacy they have left behind. This day is meaningful to survivors and reminds us that every child matters. It is an important opportunity for First Nations, Inuit, MAT peoples, local governments, schools, and communities to come together in the spirit of reconciliation and hope for generations of children to come. We had hoped to share today's smudge ceremony with folks, but we do have another uh, resource to share with you now. Before we move to that learning opportunity, I'd like to draw folks' attention to one of HHS's four Indigenous signs of welcome. If Leslie, if you could go back one, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, so this, as I mentioned, is one of HHS's four Indigenous signs of welcome here on the screen. This image of an elder with a smudge bowl and feather has been adapted by artist Jay Haven from the mural he created for Michaela's room at the McMaster Children's Hospital. Jay Haven is a multidisciplinary artist of Haudenosaunee, Mohawk, and Scottish Canadian ancestry and a proud member of the Six Nations of the Grand River Mohawk Bear Clan. In the short video we do want to share with you, Barbara Van Every practices smudging in the courtyard at the Jurovinsky Hospital and Cancer Center. Smudging is a spiritual healing ceremony performed by some Indigenous people. Smudging involves the practice of brushing smoke created by the burning of one or more of the four sacred medicines, cedar, sage, sweet grass, and traditional tobacco. These medicines are burned in a smudge pot or abalone shell and are aired by an eagle feather to produce smoke. Participants in a smudge ceremony brush the smoke of these medicines over themselves as a cleaning ritual. After the ceremony, the ashes are allowed to cool and then return to the earth. Although there may be variations from person to person and from nation to nation, smudging is considered a way to cleanse oneself or a place, a way to, go, a way to let go of negativities, to ground oneself to a task or place, and or to connect oneself to the creator.
We hope you enjoyed that short video and gave you a sense of what you also missed out and what we missed out as well in the live smudge ceremony that was held. I'd also like to remind everyone about a resource I have shared uh, at our town hall throughout this month. It is that Orange Shirt Day calendar of learning opportunities. It's on the Human Rights and Inclusion Team hub page. It's been circulated in Daily Dispatch, Dispatch, and we really encourage everyone to engage with this calendar as you're able to. As I noted in the Q&A earlier, we will leave this calendar up on the hub to allow you to engage in some of these ongoing opportunities beyond the month of September. If you haven't yet done so, today is the day to open that calendar and select just one learning opportunity for yourself to start with. Beyond the calendar of learning opportunities, there are other ways to engage in Orange Shirt Day today. You can visit the Orange Shirt Society website. Someone so kindly put this in the Q&A earlier as well. And you will find a plethora of opportunities to learn and suggestions for how to engage in reconciliation, not just today, but every day. You can read the National Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and ask yourself what you will do as an individual to support completing these calls to action and engaging in meaningful reconciliation. If you happen to work at uh, our general site, our Juravinsky site, or at MUMC, you can visit the main cafeterias today to try Three Sisters Soup. Check out the Daily Dispatch that uh, will be coming, uh, sorry, that came out yesterday to learn more about this opportunity. Uh, please know that the Volunteer Association is donating the profits of the sale of this soup as well as uh, Orange Shirt Day cookies to the Indigenous Outreach Programming here at the HHS. And with that, I will turn things back to you, Erin. Okay, thanks very much, Tiffany, Lee, for that. Uh, very important that people can uh, look at that video afterwards uh, on share, so that's great to see. Uh, and as well, uh, thanks to the team for uh, taking uh, some chances today and trying to go to that live cut uh, we'll keep improving our, our ability to do those things with the Zoom technology, but I think it was a nice uh, way, a nice attempt and, and something nice to try today on this important day. So I uh, also want to point out that the calendar of events, uh, which if you haven't had a chance to look at it, is a really interesting resource for your own learning and information, uh, was picked up by Ontario Health uh, and as well as the Ontario Hospital Association and shared as a as a best practice and an available resource for the sector. So congratulations uh, to the team that pulled that together and to everybody that hasn't had a chance yet would really encourage you to take a look uh, at that today or any day of the year. So uh, wonderful stuff. We have chance uh, now for a q and I know our panelists have been busy typing answers to questions. I think there's about two dozen that have been answered so far uh, in the Q&A. So please, if you have a chance, take a look at the answered tab in the Q&A and you can see answers to some of the questions already asked. Uh, one theme in there, I guess I want to pose uh, Dr. Mertz when we have you and your expertise available to us today. There was a, a theme, I think, in some of the questions about um, knowing whether or not people that are visiting the hospital now are in fact exhibiting the side effects of the vaccine or uh, are we aware of whether or not people who are coming in uh, with COVID uh, have received the vaccine. Can you talk a little bit about what information is being tracked now to ass assess the efficacy of the vaccine? Uh, and its side effects. Yeah, I, I feel like people are sort of mixing up two separate processes. So one process is about COVID patients coming in and collecting information on their vaccine status, which is something that's being reported to the province and this being shared publicly on a daily basis, minus uh, weekends, because no, not all hospitals are reporting that or um, public holidays such as today when, when there's no, no reporting coming out, but that's the one process. The other process is around side effects from the vaccine, and that's the onus of, of all treating physicians, regardless in, of the setting that they are working in, to report suspected side effects of the vaccine to the authorities, and that's going through public health. That's a separate process, a process that should be in place. And I mentioned in one of my answers, if you have concerns that some of those potential side effects are not being reported, please reach out to that most responsible physician and ask whether they did the reporting, whether you can help with the reporting or talk to your manager, the chief, whoever. Uh, but that's, that's an ingrained process that has been in place for any types of vaccines in the past as well. And there's a clear um, process for that, which in this case uh, flows uh, through public health 
and then is being shared up to the federal level. And uh, that information is being collated as well. And as you're aware, it, it does have impact on, on policy, as you may have heard yesterday that within Ontario, we've seen more ca cases of myocarditis in young male with the Moderna vaccine than the Pfizer vaccine. So the policy now changed that the recommendation for that age group for males is to preferentially receive uh, the Pfizer vaccine rather than Moderna. So that reporting does work and does have impact on, on uh, vaccine policy within the province and within Canada. Great, thanks for that. I know another question that came up today and has come up in the past about vaccines in particular is the issue of booster shots. And maybe you could comment about uh, where we're headed in terms of booster shots and, and what's important to keep in mind on that topic. I think the key message is still the same, and we've been saying this for, for weeks and months since the, uh, the signal occurred in Israel in particular, that there's more breakthrough infections. At this point, it looks like the waning of Im immunity first and foremost affects um, the risk of getting infected or testing positive. We don't have such a convincing signal at this point that it increases the risk through waning for more severe outcomes, possible admission, ICU admission, death. So it looks like so far that the immunity holds up for that with a few exceptions. And those exceptions are those patients who currently um, qualify for a third dose. And I'm not sure whether we should call them boost or not. It's just an additional dose to further increase your immune response. And that's the elderly, that's patient with um, immunocompromised status who aren't able to build such a strong immune response from two doses, so a third dose is being offered. And that's where we are currently at. Obviously, this is a very hot topic, and you're aware that any jurisdiction is treating it slightly differently with the US now going ahead with more third doses, basically for the general population, which we don't do, and many other jurisdictions don't do. Um, all I can assure you of, it's certainly one of the hottest topics that are being discussed at all the vaccine tables within Canada. They have a close eye on the data. So far, they don't see the need nor the evidence that the third dose for the general population is beneficial. This being said, at some point, this may likely change, but we are not there yet. And maybe one last question for you while I have you in the hot seat. I know I've been reading in the media this week about uh, the process undertaking to try and approve the vaccine for use in children, uh, prospectively the immunization process uh, for kids in school. Can what, What's the scuttlebutt in your profession? Uh, what, what is happening right now? What do we need to know? So as far as I know, the, um, the data will be uh, forwarded uh, to Health Canada within the next few weeks, and then the, uh, the process of approval will start. Assuming that approval will be given, we are probably looking at best case scenario November uh, or by the end of this year with the potential approval, if all the data is convincing enough, maybe uh, there's a need for more review for additional data, et cetera, et cetera. So hard to predict that. I, I think November, December sounds plausible at this point that the vaccine may become approved. And in the meantime, as you're probably aware, uh, public health across the province is already preparing to, to be ready to, to administer the vaccines once they are approved and they are here and available for us. Okay, great. Well, thanks for that. Well, I'm conscious of time. I do want to leave uh, a little bit of time for celebrations. I know our panelists have answered a number of questions. There's a few, I think, still lingering too that I would encourage uh, those asking to take a look back in the presentations uh, given today. I think they were answered there specifically around uh, our current reporting around vaccination rates, uh, et cetera, that uh, Michelle and Susan provided that information. So uh, that is available there. And uh, we will uh, take into account the questions asked today to try and shape the content for future uh, town halls. And I know that there were some suggestions in there about that. Uh, we are holding a special town hall uh, next week on Thursday at our usual time and place. Uh, to talk more about our vaccine management policy, uh, so details to come about that. Uh, but we do now have a chance for celebration, so we'll open the chat function, and I'd encourage you 
if you have uh, something you'd like to remark upon uh, today in terms of a colleague or a, an accomplishment or anything that you think is worth celebrating, now's the time to do so. You can type it in the chat function or you can raise your hand and we'll call on you to give your celebration live. Sharon, I see you've come on camera. Is there a celebration you'd like to give today? No, I just wondered, uh, Aaron, it would probably be appropriate to recognize our long service award individuals while well, we had a separate celebration uh, this week to acknowledge that group. I know not everyone could attend or perhaps seen some of the communication. So just a shout out to all of those uh, that have met these uh, milestones uh, and acknowledgement of all their work. Thank really you. incredible. Some incredible 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, and even a 55 year milestone this year. So incredible stuff. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, Kirsten Crawley, I see you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Hi there, not, not a particularly uh, a special event, but I do want to acknowledge um, in, in watching the organization, our logistics folks and materials management. Um, you know, keeping up with supplying units um, is uh, tough at the best of times, but when we have various shortages, the supply chain issues globally still continue to be such a challenge. And our logistics folks are always uh, trying to keep our units stocked and so on. But um, you know, they're a group that are so supportive of the clinical care that's going on. Um, and I just wanted to do a shout out. Um, you're such an important part of uh, what goes on in our organizations in every corner every day. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks for that, Kirsten. I see a couple here in the chat form I'll read out from Kevin Marley. Uh, congratulations to Kathy Midge Hall, a DI booking clerk at the U uh, Urgent Care Center who's retiring today after 41 years of service to HHS. Wow, thank you very much, Kathy, and congratulations on your retirement. Thanks, Kevin, for pointing that out. See another one here from Charissa Corden, uh, sending my deepest gratitude to all of the managers, directors, HR leaders, clinical resource team leaders, and everyone involved in making the virtual nursing career fair successful uh, this month on September 21st and 22nd. So thanks very much, Charissa, for sharing that one. And from Jordan Kloss, Big thanks to the pharmacy automation team and to Mumsy Senior Pharmacy Technician, Alan Smith, for all the support rolling out the new technology and new processes for the Mumsy MCH inpatient pharmacy. Well done. Good stuff. All right. Well, I don't see any more rolling in. Oh, here's one more for Charissa from Charissa. The PR group also helped with the virtual nursing career fair. So throw that in there. Some colleagues of mine, thanks to them. And thanks for pointing that out. Celebrating Dr. Mertz. So from Heather Bergen, celebrating Dr. Mertz for his supportive conversations with uh, vaccine hesitant individuals. Great job. Thanks very much. Whew. Bruce Squires, celebrating our indigenous patient and family navigators across all of HHS for the work they do. Uh, to raise awareness and ability to better support Indigenous patients and families. Very timely. Uh, thank you, Bruce, for putting that one in there. Okay, well, I want to get uh, everyone back uh, to your day uh, your, and your work on time. Really appreciate you taking the time. Maybe Sharon, uh, final words to you. No, uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for joining and really just emphasizing what Tiffany said. I hope everyone takes today to have some meaningful conversations as we reflect on why we have Orange Shirt Day uh, and Canada's first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. So thank you everyone and have a good day.